I probably would, you know, look at getting some protection to the upside on, on corn, it, especially if you're west of the Mississippi in a flooded area, you know, where it could farmers could end up being tight holders of that grain if they don't have a crop. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. We sure do appreciate you joining us, and we look forward to talking with you each and every day on something ag-related, whether it's markets or human interest stories, what have you. And uh, today is no different. I want to encourage you to like these videos, subscribe to the videos, and share them with others as well. Well, we have Justin McKinney with us today, and he is with Comstock Investments, and we're going to take a look at how we wrapped up the trading week and I was kind of joking before we started recording here Justin it was kind of like a a one day trading week uh we had the 4th of July right in the middle of it there so it really interrupted things I have a feeling a lot of traders weren't even really in the office today yeah light volume all the way around today uh it was nice to see some green on the screen uh corn you know we July is pretty well off the board down to few contracts left to open entry. So we look forward to that, or look at that September. We had that up five here today, new crop December corn up four and a half. Switching over to the beans, we ended up with August soybeans up eight and a half, November beans up eight and a quarter. Um, today, the big mover was wheat. You know, we had a strong wheat market right across the board, 10 on the spring wheats, 16 cents on the uh, Chicago and 15 on the KC, 15 and a half. So, Wheat was really mover today. We had good export sales right out, uh, right off the bat this morning. Um, as we look to the end of next week, where we have some USDA and WASD reports on things like that. So uh, wheat was kind of in the driver's seat today, and hopefully we can get some follow through into next week. You think the harvest lows are behind us now on the wheat? Yeah, one well, would think that we maybe are starting to carve out some harvest lows. A little bit concerning. Everybody is thinking this. You know, the wheat stocks number will be quite a bit higher, uh, led by the spring wheat, which, you know, the guys that I have growing spring wheat are really bad on the water. So uh, other places are going to have to pick up the pace on the spring wheat versus maybe some of those min northern Minnesota growers. But, uh, you know, you, you really would think that maybe we got that harvest low bias and we look forward to what we could have in this WASD report. Exports have been really good so far this marketing year for wheat and continued news out of France about uh, their crop being down, but you know, they're carrying a little bit more stocks in. So we'll see how that all shakes out next week. But one would think that we would maybe be knocking on those harvest lows. You know, it seems like the corn market is still trying to shrug off that bearishness that we had from that last WASDE report or that last uh, planted acreage report. I'm sorry. That was about a million and a half acres higher than expected. Um, don't know if attitudes have changed very much about that, or what do you think uh, by the trade right now? Well, you know, one would think that the attitude has changed. We continue to see heavier hands in the western part of the belt, but at the end of the day, Marla, we you know we have a stocks problem that we need to chew through. Uh, I, I know there's some really good basis numbers west of the Mississippi. Probably need to encourage people to get those uh, moved and locked in. At the end of the year, when we flip this calendar over, we're going to have, you know, somewhere north of 2 billion bushels that are going to have to get carried into next year. And it will happen, but at what price, right? If the commercials have to carry it, um, we're probably looking at a basis number that won't be where it's at today anyway. But, you know, and, and in those parts that are getting flooded out, I'm sure that the basis is just trying to keep those bushels moving. People are trying to retain ownership. Uh, with the uncertainty of the new crop in those areas, but it would let, it would be great to think that we put something of substance in the corn market. We're probably not going to get much for bullish information unless it's something in the usage category next week. So we kick the can down the road until we get to the resurvey, which I'm guessing will probably be August time frame on the planted acres. You know, it's it's kind of a shame that you can't just run an auger from the Dakotas down to Southwest Kansas and just directly move that, that corn down there. I mean, you're talking such a huge basis differential there. Uh, I mean, we're like what dollar and a half dollar 70, something yeah, like that. Probably. between them. You know, I mean, I wonder what it does cost to truck. That, that must be about what the cost is. Apparently. I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, now are anything's changing uh, when it comes to the, the crop and, and the basis that you see as we get deeper into the growing season? And, and uh, it seems like a lot of the uh, corn is really taking advantage of that moisture now. Uh, if you get outside the flooded areas, you were telling me in the central part of the Corn Belt, it seems like things are really taking off pretty well. Things do look good. Um, you know, if, again, tongue in cheek, because we have so many clients that have been flooded out or, you know, prevent plant, things like that. But, you know, it, the trade appears the crop to be off and to a decent start, whether we're at that 181 or not at the final, I would have to probably bet on the lower side of that but the you you know the usda is not going to adjust, adjust that number at this point in time you know the next two weeks we're looking at some pretty key time for tasseling and pollination non-threatening forecast um you know it it'll, it'll be interesting to see how we come in and re trade this market Sunday night or Monday morning now I have heard that uh, you go way out in the eastern part of the corn belt for example, the Carolinas have been really dry from what I understand. It sounds like that there are some pockets on the east side that could definitely use some rain. And boy, we'd sure love to send them some from over here, but that's just not the way that it's shaping out this year. So the corn market is kind of sluggish. Uh, it, it did get a little bit of positive action here on Friday to round out the week. Soybeans are outperforming them. Uh, they had a fairly strong week the last half of the week there it didn't look too bad do you think the bottom is in on the beans now well you know there's nothing like a loaded question on a limited trade friday but you know it one would think you know we're, we saw some exports not great export numbers today uh was hoping for a little bit better number i would sure think at some point we're hearing that the south american farmer has been taking advantage moving significantly more beans into the market versus last year at this time due to the exchange rate. So, you know, we hope that we get to that August time frame. maybe we can start picking up some of those sales. And again, the, the 500 pound elephant to, in the room is still the Chinese purchases that have not showed up yet on the sales reports uh, of any substance. So, you know, will they come? I sure hope so. Um, I would believe that they will at some point, but uh, when, once we would get a flash sale, I would, Looking at the chart, and if we could get some fundamental news behind it, I would think, you know, maybe then we have probably put a bottom in this bean market for a while. Well, we're getting to that time of year where we probably wouldn't be too far away from starting to see some sales for a new crop, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, July, August, they should, we're going to have some harvested beans in September down south. So if we're not going to, if we're going to get those sales, we need to start getting them on the books. It's becoming a concern. So have you uh, been keeping track of what's going on with the soy meal and the soy oil markets now? Have they well, shifted the, around because Argentina was getting a crop this year finally? Right. And today, you know, we've seen that soy oil rally like six, seven bucks in the last week and a half, two weeks uh, on the Indonesia tariffs with China, the geopolitical things, you know, we, we've shifted. The, the pressure was on the soy oil for the last six, seven months as it continue to get beat up. But now it seems like maybe we turn the page a little bit here. We have a little bit, you know, po more positive news in the soil oil. Again, export sales were not very good on soil oil this week. So um, are we getting the cart ahead of the horse? Possibly. It would be nice to see some either Chinese bean purchases or some soil oil purchases uh, of substance to, to at least confirm that we have something in the bottom on this thing. Let's let's kind of bridge this conversation with the livestock side then. Uh, if you put your livestock hat on and you look at the way the grain markets are acting now, uh, do you think you need to be more aggressive about booking some feed right now? Or do you think this is just a little bump in the road and you'll get a better chance? You know, that's a good question. If the margins work on, on locking the feed up, I probably would, you know, look at getting some protection to the upside on, on corn especially if you're west of the Mississippi in a flooded area, you know, where it could farmers could end up being tight holders of that grain if they don't have a crop. So, yeah, I, I don't think that's a bad idea to start taking a look, a look at that as we move forward here. Uh, the hog guys, you know, those margins are just so depressed right now that, you know, any break that they can get in corn, if it, if it pencils, probably get it covered. But 
Boy, those things have just been getting beat up. They had huge export sales today, Marlin, fifth, over 59,000 metric ton. We still couldn't hardly manage anything in the hogs. Uh, midday bellies up $13, still hovered in that 125, 126 range. It's just a tough market in those hogs right now. Well, let's take a look at this cattle market, Justin. Uh, looking at a bar chart, I mean, it didn't perform all that great on Friday, but we have continued that uptrend line now for quite a while. Is it acting a little toppy in your opinion here, You're running out of gas? Well, I think that a lot of people in the trade were expecting, you know, we had really good box beef sales. Uh, prices moved higher going into the 4th of July. Everybody was is a little uh, reluctant at these levels to see what the movement was after the Fourth of July. Today, midday boxes came out up a dollar to, uh, you know, over three hundred and thirty on the choice cuts. So I, it seems like the market is waiting for some negative news, and everybody is just holding back. We still have cash significantly above the August futures. Now we have a long time before those August futures go into delivery. So uh, it feels like everybody's pretty nervous at these levels right here. But as long as we can keep product moving, uh, it, it doesn't look terrible. And the hogs, on the other hand, they they look like they've been trying to search for a bottom. I don't know if yeah. they found it yet. but We um, can't seem to find a bottom on those hogs. The kill has just been, and I, and I feel like a broken record talking to you about this, but all year kill has just been high, weights have been high, uh, exports have been good, but we just cannot seem to get any excitement in that pork complex at all. And you look out towards the December, you know, you're trading sub $70 hogs in December. Uh, you just wonder how long people can hang on at those levels. Do you think there could be a spread opportunity there between live cattle and lean hog? Well, there's been a lot of people that have tried that the last two years because that has been historically wide. Uh, right now, you, you know, you have a market that has fundamental footing with the numbers. And if we were to trim the weights versus the hogs, um, no, I don't think that I would trade that right now. It's just this hogs are so depressed that it's going to be tough to rally them, I feel like, without some sort of uh, major news. Any of these outside markets catch your attention this week with that abbreviated trade that we had? We had gold uh, $31 higher on the August. Platinum traded $37 higher. Those metals really had a good day on Friday today. Uh, dollar back down just a little bit. So, you know, if we get that dollar to correct, hopefully we can help that export program out across all ag commodities. Well, I, I keep thinking about this corn, and now here we are past the 4th of July. A lot of times, um, you know, if you can make it to tasseling time in the corn and it has moisture to work with, it's kind of an uphill slog, isn't it, to try and get that market to rally once you get past mid-July, let's say? For sure. Seasonality is not your friend there. Um, trend is, you know, you either have a crop or you don't have a crop, 4th of July. And judging by the commitment of traders reports where we, you know, we're massively short in the corn pits we're going to need some reason for them to cover and the farther we get down the road without an acres resurvey or or something on that nature to change the fundamental storyline you know what's going to push those funds out that that's ultimately the question we have now is what is going to be the catalyst to push them out i guess the question is how much can they add to their short positions i i guess uh they still have a little bit of room, don't they, before they get to their record short? Well, they do, but, and for this time of the year, it's pretty, we're already pushing the short side of the market. So, you know, if we can't rally and get them to cover during planting, which they did rally some, but we didn't even get back to even during planting. We have a non-threatening forecast. Something is going to have to change, and it's probably going to have to come from the acres report if there was a, you know, if we, we do lose a couple million acres to flooding or when the combines run, if the yields end up being somewhat disappointing, which, again, there's going to be some good crop out there, but there probably will be a few more holes than what the the drive-by window survey looks like right now. It'd be interesting to tell. Well, here we are with September corn still over $4. I mean, it's not anything compared to what it was a couple of years ago, but on the other hand, 
it looks like maybe there could still be a lot of downside potential here. I mean, is that something where you would be looking at maybe some puts just for a little extra protection anyway? Yeah, you know, in if you're looking at September core and the majority of our viewers, uh, that's old crop month. I know you get down south, uh, you're going to see some new crop harvest against that. But just as a general statement, yeah, a guy could uh, take a look at some put options on that. But if you're in an area with basis that's significantly over the board, uh, I would probably be more inclined to actually move the physical on that. And if, you know, calls are relatively cheap, you're probably going to have to get some time on those calls out to the de December or March. Um, but that's everybody individual risk tolerance. So they'd have to give us a shout. We could walk through some strategies if, if that's what they were looking to do. But if you have good basis in your area, west of the Mississippi, and uh, you got old crap corn in the bin, probably need to get some working offers because we're running out of time on that. Now, here's a, a bit of an outlier, but what about Hurricane Barrel? It, it sounds like it could be heading up toward Texas maybe next week, at least around Brownsville. Um, so if that would head up to Texas and continue on northward, uh, at least with the moisture shield there, would that have any impact on the markets? Didn't seem to really help the cotton market at all today. Yeah, I, you know, it's hard telling. Everybody views moisture as bearish price, so it, it'll be tough to see unless there's significant damage. And then you also run the, the risk of having damage at an export facility where you could possibly be down or lose some time shipping. So uh, I think it remains to be seen because we've seen that play all both sides of that coin before in previous years. All right. Well, normally we would have, a, or I guess we should say, we'll be back to a normal full trading week next week. Uh, now that we got the holiday out of the road, it should be interesting to see if we can detect any kind of patterns coming out of the holiday. Uh, you never know after the 4th of July. Uh, what are you going to be watching for on uh, Monday morning or Sunday night when we reopen the trade there? What's going to be your, your clues? Well, for sure, we're going to be watching weather. You know, there there was some split between the European and the GFS, whether or not we were going to get some sort of high pressure ridge forming. Uh, that would be enough to maybe pause the selling for a little bit here. Uh, we'll be watching that Sunday night as we come into Monday. Um, I, I really think you got two weeks worth of weather to watch here yeah, and the report at the end of the week. So if there's any positioning ahead of the report or profit taking on the short side, may give a producer a chance to, uh, lighten up some sales on, or make some sales and lighten up inventory on the crop. Good opportunity for everybody to stay in close touch with their risk, manage, uh, risk management advisor or broker and uh, keep tabs on what's going on because it's that time of year. Justin, good to talk with you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Justin McKinney with Comstock Investments, and that'll do it for this episode. For producer Brianne Hendrickson, I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.